Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to our 52nd session of the Med AI Group Exchange Sessions. Um, this week, we have Hyeon Jung from MIT here with us to present her work on real-time seizure detection using EEGs. Um, Hyeon is a PhD student at MIT, um, advised by Marze Gassini and Colin Stoltz. Her primary research focus has been on developing and applying machine learning uh, methods to solve real-world clinical tasks. Um, she uses um, data like time series EHR as well as signals. And before joining MIT, she received her BS in Biological Sciences, an MS in Computer Science from KAST, and an MD at um, Yonsei University. So thank you so much, Hewan, for joining us today. And before we start, do you have any preferences on how you'd like to take questions? Is it cool if we interrupt you or would you like them at the end? Yes, please uh, feel free to stop me when you all have any questions. Yeah. Awesome, yeah. So let's try to make this session as interactive as possible. And uh, without further ado, let me hand it over to Hewan. Cool. Thank you for the introduction. Hello, everyone. I'm Hewan Zhang, a first year PhD student at CSA MIT. Today, I'd like to introduce our work, uh, Real-Time Seizure Detection Using EEG, a um, comprehensive comparison of recent approaches under a realistic setting. Um, in this paper, we are presenting a comprehensive evaluation of EEG seizure detection tasks in a real-time setting, and we all also produce, uh, propose a novel evaluation metric for the task. And this work was done while I was at AI Tricks, South Korea. Yeah. So this is a table of content I'm gonna cover today. And first I'd like to introduce to you about the EEG-based seizure detection. Epilepsy is a neurological disorder characterized by epileptic seizures and EEG or electroencephalogram is an important diagnostic method to, uh, that physicians use to record brain activity and detect seizures by monitoring the signals. Physicians routinely scan the continuous EEG signals and cross-check the patient video recorded concurrently to find out the symptom uh, that corresponds with the seizure for the potential diagnosis and evaluation. However, this manual process can often take up several hours, making it very labor-intensive as well as untimely. Some uh, characteristics of EEG signal data set that the label, uh, which would be the seizure duration, or in other words, ictal period, would be very sparse within the whole 24-hour continuous recording. And this positive label uh, for a seizure occurs in the burst as soon as it, as soon as it starts. Furthermore, most of the time, physicians don't label the exact, in, exact onset and offset of uh, seizure when they diagnose a patient and they just re, uh, write the uh, readings of the EEG. So we need their costly label to pause, process the data set and construct the data set out of the raw EEG signal. And even though we have a label, label might be a little bit noisy or there could potentially be label disagreement uh, among number of physicians. Thus, uh, we might need some real-time seizure detector to capture some of the seizure events before physicians are scanning through the whole recordings to achieve fast and accurate diagnosis, which would uh, reduce the time of de detection and diagnosis. Then what are the methodologies people have been utilizing to detect seizures? And what are the problems they, that remains to be solved for the current real-time seizure detectors? Sorry. Uh, yeah, general pipeline of seizure detection models follows a diagram. So generally data processing is followed by a signal extractor. And then the data set is fed into the model to perform uh, seizure detection. I'll briefly talk about two main parts of uh, seizure detection module, signal feature extractor and models. And I'll also briefly talk about the evaluation metrics people have been using uh, for this uh, seizure detection test. Conventionally, a number of signal extractors uh, that were used for audio and signal data set have been applied to EG seizure, seizure signal, EG seizure signal extraction before and after people have applied uh, convolutional neural nets or other deep learning model. Yeah, to, to briefly give you some of the backgrounds, um, people could, can uh, feed the model just, just the raw data set, or they can also use fast Fourier transform related uh, signal extractors, such as short time Fourier transform 
or linear frequency spectral coefficients or frequency bands that are extracting time frequency components of 2D features, which, which we call, also call spectrograms. Um, yeah, so for the methods called uh, frequency bands, people extract fre frequency time features over several frequency bands after applying S S STFT. For LFCC, uh, pe we, uh, people apply a linear frequency sensor filter filters to the STFT output. And there's, there are some other um, uh, signal feature extractors, such as downsampling or SyncNet. Uh, for, uh, so SyncNet uses the convolutional network architectures to discover meaningful filters by conv convolving input and features, filters. People also downsample the raw input to multiple uh, sampling rates, and which would help we have uh, multiple aspects of original signal. We will be using these uh, six sets of signal feature extractors in our experiments as well, and we'll get back to this figure in the same in the method section. Um, quick question here, Hyun. So. In your analysis, did you find most of the methods use all, like say, 19 channels, or do they use like a few channels or, or maybe single channel EEGs? What what was prevalent? Yeah, very good question. We uh, we evaluated the um uh, we 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 um, constructed data set using both like unipolar and bipolar montage. So we. We um, did experiments with unipolar EEG and also bipolar EEG, which, which we also call like a banana montage. So yeah, we constructed this this amount of like uh, leads for bipolar EEG. And the main main data set, main result I'll be presenting in today's talk would be bipolar EEG results. And the like result was like similar in both both uh, data sets. I see. Okay, thank you. Back to original figure. Yeah. So this is the summary of the papers that use each of the signal feature extractors. So yeah, I'll post this um, um, presentation afterwards to the moderators so they can look into it afterwards. So this is this is a slide about the model. Um, recent studies include included introduced deep neural network models for EEG based feature detection which includes CNN or encoder or attention module or CNN plus uh, LSTM layers at the end of CNN layers and a gated recurrent unit, unit I, I didn't put it in the slide, but GRU. And some ex included the signal ex extractors in their pipeline, but some did not include them. And some of the previous model, models cannot be applied for real-time seizure detection because they are trained to detect seizure events on the whole EG signal. But more recent works focus on building real-time seizure detection using, for instance, LSTM, but they showed a little bit of slow speed to be a real-time detector. So if we want it to be a real-time detector, it we want it to be we want it one one each of a batch process the uh, process the input within the shift length, but it, it was a little bit slower than we were expecting to, it to be real-time detected. Yeah, and some recent works also tried machine learning approaches such as contrastive learning in Sinclair fashion, which, um, which with a lead-wise augmentation. And although I did not include in this slide, C's work and utilized graph neural network to uh, include the inherent characteristics of lead geometry. Limitations of previous works I uh, stated here uh, that, that are that like they have been they, ha they have not been compared against each other under the same experiment setting. And we are introducing com comprehensive comparison of all these models and compares a combination with the signal extractors in a real time setting. Next, I'm going to talk about the evaluation metrics. There are a number of popul popular scoring metrics for seizure detection tests, and we score three of them and suggest another metric that we can use, uh, that can be used for more accurate evaluation. First metric is any overlap, which measures the true positive by counting how much prediction, so this is reference, which is label, so how much prediction uh, overlaps with the uh, reference label. 
Yeah, so any overlap is very uh, permissive compared to other methods as it only counts the number of overlap. So you can see from the first example that this metric uh, has true positive rate of one, even though it only detected the situation in one signal uh, chunk. So they divided the whole chunk into multiple chunks. And then they only, it like was correct, correctly predicting only one signal, but the positive rate is one. And uh, in this case, they calculated the overlapping sequences and true positive and false negative was calculated as such. Another metric called time aligned event scoring met, uh, test measures uh, the amount of overlap between the label and prediction. So this is the definition of true positive. Thus the true positive here uh, is defined by the ratio of overlapping duration over the whole duration. Test produces a low sensitivity compared to uh, any overlap, but a slightly higher uh, false alarm. You can see a slightly higher false alarm. Final method I'm going to introduce in related work section is called EPA, it which evaluates the performance based on each sample, which each uh, each of the signal chunk within each EPA, providing more relevant metric for the real time CG detection. It directly counts the overlap between the ground truth and prediction per unit time window. So true positive here is five. They, they got the correct answer for five uh, signals. We will introduce one more metric called margin, and I will get back to you about this in the method section. Um, one more question in, in the previous slide. So what, what is the, um, like how, is it one second or, or what is the time duration of each epoch that people typically use? Or in your evaluation, how do you decide the window size? Is that and something I, that you... Oh, yeah. That's a good uh, question. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, people have been using this like different experiment setting, but we followed uh, one setting with, which we uh, chunk each of, which we chunk the um, whole 24 hour EG signal into 30 second streaks and then we okay. made yeah 30 second streaks of a batch and then put it into the model i see and so between two epochs like you do not have any overlap you, you yeah we, yes, we chunk the um, whole signal into the um, 30 second chunks non-overlapping chunks yeah got it okay thank you Do you have any like uh more like continuous scores um like for example measuring how much overlap there is uh, between the ground truth and the prediction um oh, not using t yeah not but not using like true positive false negative oh, oh. Okay, I see okay so sorry I missed this part. Um, yeah, yeah, this is a little bit misleading because usually we define true positive in bi binary situations. But yeah, yeah, this, exactly. They define like true positive to be the uh, ratio of duration. So okay, I see. A little mm -hmm. bit, it might be a little bit misleading. Yeah, it makes sense. Thanks. Yeah, usually we define true positive in adjacency matrix, but in this case, it's not. Mm -hmm. Cool. Let's move on. And I like to talk about the four components of our framework data set, uh, proof processing, which includes sliding window and window shift length, and signal feature extractors, and finally, some of the models we use. So, yeah, we perform seizure onset detection tests where the model receives four second signals with one second sliding window process. This shifts one second each time. The model detects whether the patient is currently in ictal phase or not within each window, given that the entire process from the feature extractor to detection must be completed within the stride time, which is one second of the slide window in, in order to guarantee real time process processing. So we use- uh, Sorry, just one clarifying question. So if I understand this correctly, you feed any of the models 30 second clips and then the model looks at four second windows um, which have a stride of one is that correct or that's correct okay, okay cool thank you 
should have, yeah, use different word, but it's not pre-processing. We, we, yeah, look, only look at the model at each four window, for four second window. Got it, okay. For data set, we use Temple University Hospital EEG seizure data corpus, which we will call TUH data set in abbreviation. A TUH data set includes uh, 642 patients with more than 7,000 EEG signal files, including heterogeneous seizure lengths across different seizure types. Actually, this was uh, after we removed some of the um, some of the patient which has small number of positive uh, positive seizure seizure events. So this was not actually the original patient cohort number, just in case. And um, we used trained validation and test set provided by the QH data corpus and removed some of the data diseases with small instances such as my myoclonic seizure. And we constructed the balanced data set such that we are including the same number of positive and negative label samples. And prior to feature extractor extraction, we um, sliced the raw data into a time window of 30 seconds without overlapping signals, as I mentioned before. And just for the for information, uh, this EEG corpus includes heterogeneous different uh, multiple types of seizure, which includes like heterogeneous seizure event time time per each uh, type of uh, seizure. So for some of the seizure type. The seizures event was a little bit very short. Some of some of them had includes longer longer sequences. To define the sliding window that defines the input of the model, we found the optimal length of sliding window and how much we will shift the window at each time. So this the size of this box and how much it slides by comparing the performance and speed of each, uh, each experiment with various window size and shift length. So intuitively, we can utilize more information with the data set, uh, data set signal window as the window size increases because we have more signals. But at the same time, the processing speed decreases gradually with the increasing window size. Also, uh, so increasing speed means uh, uh, decreasing speed means increasing processing time here. Just also, the wider window size decreases uh, the temporal resolution of seizure detection. So there's some obvious trade-off. And for the shift length, the longer it becomes, and it's it will be really uh, sparse to detect the um, yeah seizure signal. So we explored the multiple window and shift lengths combination and found out the four second window length and one second window shift length most suits the trade off between per performance and speed. Then the model, then, then again, the model will receive signal input of four second window every one second. Yeah. And again, the, we want, again, we want a model to pre pre process each window within the, within the shift length, which is one second. After the data processing, we then compared the performance of six different feature extractors I introduced in the related works section for uh, real-time seizure detection tasks with multiple models. The feature extractor me methods include raw signal without further calculation, further like feature extraction, and um, sync net by using predefined CNN filters and frequency bands with predefined predetermined important frequency ranges EG characteristics and short time Fourier transform, linear frequency sexual coefficient, and downsampling methods. And we compared all of the settings with 15 different types of deep learning models for our real time CG detection experiment, which, is cat which, which can be categorized by three like, main architectures CNN two dimension with a plus LSTM or by LSTM transformers and standalone model, standalone CNN models. So for the models where the CNN 2D modules are used, we use one, one dimensional kernel to extract EEG signals feature in channelized manner. And we also used uh, 1D kernel for CNN 1, 1D 
TNN1D uses the uh, similar architecture, but it uses, it uses concatenated uh, EEG input. So we only have 1D input, which has concatenated EEG per each B. Some of the model listed here contain uh, LSTM module or by LSTM module before classifier block. So, block. so the previous signal information are delivered to the current time. And instead of sim simple convolutional layers that we use here, we can also use a ResNet encoder with, with and without, with and without dilation of convolutional layer and mobile net encoder before LSTM. These are number three or fives. And number six, sevens are the same, ha has the same architecture as PNN 2D, except that it gets 1D input. And we additionally had experiments with transformer type models. So feature transformer uses tra transformer encoder and convolutional layers. And guided feature transformer is the same model as the feature transformer basically, but except the fact that each G channel uh, distance based adjacency matrix is multiplied to the transformer's attention map. So adjacency matrix, this one represents the neighboring connection of EEG electrodes. And we use distinct matrix for unipolar and bipolar uh, input EEG data. For next, next thing I'm gonna explain is about the evaluation metric. So for a strict and diverse aspect of the model performance, uh, to, to evaluate the model performance in stricter and diverse diversely, we adopted four different evaluation methods, which includes the three methods I introduced in the related work section. Actually five, sorry. Yeah, three I introduced in the related work section and another one we are proposing what is called margin. I'm gonna also explain about latency later. So uh, like any overlap and test, margin uh, evaluates the performance within the whole EEG signal without, uh, not not within each uh, each window, and we um, we allow set margin error before and after the seizure. So this uh, black line is onset and offset of seizure, and we allow set margin before and after the onset and offset of seizure. So we uh, allow we, um, we we can say that this model predicts well if the if the prediction lies within this set margin window. So this metric compensates for the uncertainty in the measured signal as well as allowing higher accuracy. And EPOC is again, the metric measured on each sliding window. Latency is uh, the metric that can be applied in the whole EEG signal. And we, it just measures the latency in one second detection. For example, for this case, uh, for, uh, for this case, let's look at this case. This one is label and this one is hypothesis. So it has this much of latency here. So it measures the latency of onset. Uh, may I ask a question about, <clears throat> about the latency? So if if a seizure is never detected, uh, what, what would be the latency here? Seizure, that is a really good question. Um, then um, it depends on the implementation, but I think we, uh, put in negative one so that we can just remove that. Uh, we can um, see that the prediction has never never occurred there. Okay, I see. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Before moving on to results, do you guys have any questions? I'm sorry, um, sorry Aaron. Like, I'm not really very familiar with the Temple University data set. So do they have any normal cases without Caesar or no? Yeah, they have normal, um, they, yeah, they have non normal, normal patients. So we classified the uh, normal, uh, normal sequence from non normal patients, normal control and nor non ictal period of patient as background. So background includes like multiple, like, um, eye movements, like noisy signals, as well as okay. other, 
in, in the TOH info sheet, they include a bunch of like information about background, and we can also do some like interest, interesting tests on like um, classifying background signal itself. There are like a bunch of labels for background as well, but in, the, in our uh, work, we um, classified them as normal for background. Okay. And another quick question is that since you are using the feature extractors uh, from the EG signal, why do you need then the convolutions with the sliding window? Because can't you just use the feature extractor and run the LSTM on top of that? Why do you need it? Sorry. Okay. Yeah, that's that's also a very good question. We could also do a signal feature extractor and not using deep learning models and just use SVM or other machine learning models and see how the performance would be. And that, that could be done like for our supplementary experiment. And um, yeah, most of the recent works, they use both uh, signal instructors and CNNs. And they're, like, in, you'll see in the results section, but there is like slight improvement over like merely using raw signal. So there could be some like, um, um, some advantage of using uh, feature extractors on top of CNNs. So that's why that's why uh, we would like to explore uh, raw signal as well as signal extractors. Okay, so you observe actually some difference from the raw data running with on raw data and running on the feature extracted features, right? Yeah, there was slight improvement. Um, okay. I can. Yeah. No worries. No worries. I was just curious. No worries. Okay, I'll go back to this slide afterwards. Okay. Another questions? Um, I had one more question. So, do you train all your CNNs and all like basically every step from scratch, or do you have you did you find any benefit by using things that have been pre-trained on other signals, for instance? Oh, that's a good question. We didn't use um um pre-trained weight. So that could be the one we can also use. But we think that the result was pretty good without pre-training. So mm -hmm. yeah. And for the real world data set, we got even more, like even better performance without training, like without pre-trained model. So yeah, that could be also explored for our like future work. Nice, thank you. The performance really depends on the uh, data set itself. Because uh, mm -hmm. yeah, before recording, we were talking about the like extension of this work I did after after publishing this work. So we have been applying this whole models and settings to uh, childhood absence epilepsy and um, uh, infantile spasms and so on, like childhood epilepsy uh, diseases. And mm -hmm. found the performance was better than what we reported here. And it seems like the some of the seizure seizure types we use, for example, childhood absence epilepsy, it's really peculiar. Hmm. Yeah. So for example, in this figure, it's childhood absence epilepsy. I think yeah. it's it, we can see in your in our naked eye that this is weird, right? Yeah, it's a really easy problem. So it the performance really depends on the um, like seizure types. I see. Data set itself. Yeah. Makes sense. Thank you. If there's no other questions. I'll move on to results. So I would like to discuss the result we got from extensive comparison of real time setting. So I would first like to show you the result comparing multiple evaluation methods where we use CNN plus LSTM. For the model. Um, reason why I'm showing you this first is that I'm going to talk about margin later, margin, this, this new um, evaluation metric later. So um, as we um, discussed in related work session, overlap is very permissive um, uh, evaluation metric. So we can see that uh, true positive rate or sensitivity measured with overlap was uh, very high. And epoch was also really high, but it's uh, really high among compared to tests. And um, we can see that margin also pr uh, provides some of the additional um, of this additional e evaluation metric for for uh, seizure detection task. So this is the result 
from for, for CNN to the LSTM. There are a bunch of other results, which I did not show you here, where we explored evaluation methods on various models and signal feature extractors. This can be found in our supplementary materials tables. So if you're interested and if you really want to like, apply our models to your setting, you can look at, look, at, look at it in our supplementary tables. We also explored multiple signal features, feature extractors on CNN 2D LSTM model with a window length of four seconds and shift length one second. And uh, STFT and frequency bands show the best performance um, among all other uh, signal feature extractors. But with our new metric margin, uh, we saw that uh, our, uh, the result with raw data set was uh, similar to frequency bands. And yeah, we, we can see we, we, we can have some additional uh, evaluation using this margin. And CPU processing speed is, of course, um, very high, uh, low factor, yeah, low, yeah, in raw data set. So this is what I was expecting on that uh, probably with raw and feature extractor that you will not see like a significant difference, you know? Yeah, yeah, we, we can say that it's not that much significant. Yeah. And do you know the balance between the positive and negative uh, snippets? Positive and negative samples, like yeah. you mean uh, signal uh, seizure and yeah, yeah, yeah. And non -inclo. We yeah. made it one one to one. Okay. okay. Yeah, but it's not actually stratified. It's not like uh, representing the real world uh, distribution. So okay. it might be a little bit problem. So we can use probably um, a stratified data set in our later later work. Okay. And this table represents the performance evaluation of uh, 15 different models that with raw EEG signal as input data set. So in the previous slide, uh, we saw that the raw signal was performing on par with other methods. So we are using raw data set for our main experiments. So here, the short version of ResNet without dilation convolution layer uh, and ResNet with dilation show the best performance among various models. And ResNet short version performed better than ResNet 18 here, as the LSTM module could capture the temporal dependency of the input signal. However, the short version of uh, uh, ResNet plus LSTM processing speed on CPU uh, is a little bit co closer to the uh, shift length, one second. So we might, we might prefer my dilation dilation version or we might prefer CNN to the LSTM version because it's very fast and lightweight and it performs um, like similar to the ResNet plus LSTM version. Another interesting experiment result was that although feature transformer showed uh, severely poor for performance, Oh, it, but it gains significant performance increase after we uh, simply have applied the channel and the adjacency matrix to its uh, attention map. And this, this might imply giving better EEG channel-wise relationship information to model could improve the uh, seizure detection task performance more. We also tried the same experiment of setting on unipolar input EEG data set and got the similar trends. Uh, ResNet short dilation and showed the best performance. And uh, in this case, mobile net performed also better, performance also well. And we also performed seizure-wise binary classification task, where for example, for general, uh, generalized seizure, we detect whether this given signal includes generalized seizure streaks or not. So each of the tasks is detecting each specific types of seizure performed pretty well. So yeah, it performed pretty well, sometimes over um, 90. Yeah, we could see that for, the, for most of the labels, our model performed pretty well. So any questions until? Now, we'll move on to conclusion section. If not, I'll move on. So finally, I'll conclude with some summary. 
So we here uh, pro provided the extensive exploration on experimental setting, which includes the combinations of multiple models and signal feature extractors, sliding and shift window lengths and evaluation metrics. So every experiments were performed in real-time seizure detection task setting so that any feature future readers might apply our off-the-shelf code to their work, which is in PyTorch in our, uh, to, to their own work. So our work can be extended to multiple multi-class classification tests. And with the help of attention or salience map, we can also do localization of uh, localization of seizure on multi-lead EEG. Okay, this is the end of this presentation. And thank you all for listening to my talk. If you have any questions, please ask, ask to me. Thank you so much, Heiwon, for the talk. Yeah. So before uh before we ask the questions, let's all give Heiwon a round of virtual applause. Thank you. All right, so um, is there any questions from the audience? Um, <clears throat> thanks for the talk, uh, Heiwan. It's great. Um, I was wondering if you could uh, maybe just elaborate on your choice of real time. You know, you sort of focused on the real time nature of it. What um, sort of what's your goal there? Um, when, uh, you, know, you talked about trying to make this as fast as possible um, in your comparison metrics. Um, are you thinking of a specific application? Yeah, we thank you for the uh, interesting, like, important question. Yeah, we were thinking of um, having the raw signal process um, process with within hospital, but with probably with a separate uh, separate device other than the seizure detector itself. So, so we're trying to um, figure out if we can do that in our hospital setting right now. But so we, yep. are you imagining a treatment being triggered within a second or are you um, uh, use, thinking of it as an assist to what's normally done? Yeah, we are more thinking of assist, assisting the whole EEG detecting, EEG diagnosing uh, system, which is done in the ward, general ward. So it would, it would just uh, raise an alarm when it detects the seizure and we would uh, the physician might come and see if this is uh, not not a false, false alarm. Yeah, but in our case, the speed of the um, speed of the our speed of the process was measured with uh, with uh, in, in Intel Xeon and Titan XP. So I don't think this can be. I'm not sure if this can be. Um, um, if we can do like embedded setting, we did we didn't do embedded setting and so on. So we cannot say for sure if this the same setting can be applied uh, if applied to the embedded uh, setting when when the um, when the model uh, detects the EEG signal within the same uh, device as EEG uh, recorder. We we can say for sure. Then. Thanks, thanks. I, I mean, I, I think about it. I, I'm one of those doctors who sometimes is sitting um, in the hospital and um, working with techs and trying to to do just this task. Um, one thing you might be able to do is just to know that at least from our point of view, like it, depending on the clinical context, oftentimes we don't need to know within seconds. Um, you know, and in fact, many times we can't know. Um, um, but uh, it really depends. Like if it's someone's first first seizure, then we'd really want to know, um, especially if there's no clinical signs of the seizure, we really want to know, you know, probably within a short amount of time. Um, but that short amount of time is, you know, on the order of, if, if it was 10 or 20 seconds, that would be great. Um, uh, most of the time our treatments, um, you know, we would institute a treatment in a, over the period of the next 20 minutes or something like that. You know, if we knew that a seizure happened for the first time for a patient. Um, 
in another context, um, you know, if we already know a patient's having seizures very regularly, then um, there's oftentimes not really a, a pressure to, to know that within the next uh, seconds or minutes, but we might want to know every two hours, sort of like what's their seizure burden to see if ongoing treatments are, are having an effect. Um, so anyway, there's to know that you have some leeway um, in choosing what your real time um, criteria is. Um, I guess theoretically, all those things are real time. It just, they have different requirements like need to know within 10 seconds or one second or two hours or 24 hours. Like those, you, you still need to know, but, but uh, um, the, the latency time is much greater. So Chris, actually, I have a related question. I was always curious about this. Since we always saw like this um, temporal models are applied in the CEG signal, do you really feel like um, if we don't have the seizure caught within the our signal range, do you think that there is any effect, like post seizure effect on the captured signal? Like if we don't have the seizure episode, can you still look at the signal and detect the patient had a seizure 20 minutes ago or even one hour ago or something like that? Um, there are things that can make it so you can suspect that a seizure happened recently. Mm -hmm. um, again, it depends on your knowledge. So if you've previously read this patient and you know what their normal baseline looks like, and now mm -hmm. you see this abnormal slowing, especially focal slowing, um, or, or um, some patients have immediate suppression of their EEG after a seizure, then okay. you could make an inference that perhaps they just had a seizure. Okay. Okay, because I think that that would be the real application of the temporal model, right? Like looking at like kind of temporal data, can you predict that if the patient had seizure before when the seizure episode is not present within your captured signal? Because otherwise if the seizure is present within the captured signal, I would imagine like simple signal extractions and like any model should work to predict, like detect the seizure. But prediction is the most powerful thing for this kind of signal, right? Um, that's not used, that's not used very much. Um, so people would, uh, in order of things, like it's, it's, um, it's actually a very difficult problem to, to know oh, okay. what every seizure is having. In fact, there are what are called, um, EEG negative seizures. Mm. So one can have seizures without them really showing up on these scalp EEGs. Wow. Um, and so a lot of, some are very easy, like the absent seizure. The main difficulty there is uh, um, just counting. So arbi somewhat arbitrarily, typically um, absent seizures, people will put a minimum time for them, say five seconds, mm. though it's not clear if that's done in the TUH data um, to distinguish what we call bursts of abnormal activity from a seizure okay. um, electrographically. And then the other hard part is that in theory, at least according to the original definitions of seizures, you're supposed to have a clinical event with it. And um, like in the case of absent seizures, you may just stare. And so people stare all the time, even without having seizures, it can be difficult to determine if that's truly a clinical seizure. Um, so um, having something that would aid in the, even in just the detection of seizures is useful um, because it's so tedious. Um, if you can do it very quickly, like what, what um, Yang's talking about here with like within a second, then potentially you can trigger treatment. So like the RNS system uses intracranial leads and triggers treatment. And in that case, it's very easy because it's intracranial, but, but uh, it's very easy because you get to choose which model to use um, for the patient. Like you don't, you don't first, you don't, you don't create a model that works for all patients. You just create a model that just works for that one patient. Okay. That's pretty interesting. Thanks, Yuan. Thank you. Thank you for the comments, Chris and Iman. Sorry, and, to talk so long. <laughs> uh, one thing we was like very interested to explore is to uh, to perform anomaly detection to uh, de to detect the uh, pre health period, but we found it really hard because like we don't have a label for pre period. Like we don't know where the pre period would be defined or where is the abnormal and where is normal. And it's like very heterogeneous across different um, seizure types. So it was really very challenging. And yeah, we haven't started like exploring it yet, but yeah, 
yeah, interesting things to explore there over there. Um, I have a question actually related to Chris' comments. Um, so do you, in your evaluation, do you said that like, a, do you limit the seizures that's like above a certain period, let's say five seconds, or do you consider each uh, single, like very short period seizure and seizure? Oh, so you mean, do we like, we, you mean you're asking if we are in, in if we in your labels, yeah. Our labels, yeah. In our labels, if we are including seizure happening more than five seconds. No, shorter than five seconds. We'll consider shorter that. than five seconds. Yeah, we also included that, and we like the balanced data set, which I um, talked about before, is uh, including uh, multiple types of like seizure events, for example, well, some of the seizure, some of the signals might have only normal signal. Some of the signal might have like um, ictal and non-ictal, ictal and non-ictal non period, or some of the signals might have non-ictal and ictal period, or ictal and finishing, finishing up period, finishing up and non-ictal period. So we have, uh, we have like six types of such kind of data set, and we balance over each uh, types of uh, data set chunk okay i see yeah i guess the reason why i'm asking is uh from what i learned from chris um like clinically uh seizures they are shorter than five seconds may not uh at least the physicians may not consider it as a real seizure so yeah i guess uh it might make some difference in terms of the evalu evaluation of these models mm -hmm. yeah Right. Uh, the, the data set chunk I'm talking about here is 30 second data set. So right. I didn't check if the if there is any um, label that has labeled less than like several seconds or something like that. I haven't checked that, but I'm pretty sure that we don't have such kind of like label, and we probably have removed that kind of like weird weirdly looking label while our while our constructing our cohort. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Is there any other questions? Yeah, I, I mean, I think I wanted just to plug in. It's just, it's really great. Just, you know, this is really helpful work when people do these, do all this work to, to compare things. I think it's really useful. Um, and so thank you very much for that and for also making the code available. It's great because it sort of makes it so we can have this dialogue um, and be talking about the same things. Um, the, the converse side of this is that it's really valuable that, um, that people at Temple have made the data, data set available. Um, and so I want to thank them. They're not here, of course, but, but also we, what we've found is looking at this data set is that perhaps that's the next area where people really need to do work. Uh, um, that is, um, you know, this, uh, this approach with these particular labels, you know, people, they, it's a lot of work to make the labels, but they're not, um, they not, may not be the things that we really want to be identifying on EEG. Um, for example, that the way they did this is that they, you know, they had undergraduates read through the reports, knowing that, and then they would mark areas on the EEG. And so for the, we think that for the easier cases, that's probably going to work out well, but there, but it doesn't have, um, the full range of what can occur on an EEG. And because they have undergraduates doing it, they kind of have to guess. So that some of the patterns that they mark, you know, I would probably say that most people would say they're non-specific patterns. Um, it's sort of like, if you know there's a seizure there, you can guess where the seizure is. Um, but if you just saw that EEG portion, people would, if being conservative, they would say, maybe something changed there. Uh, maybe the person uh, was moving or maybe the person was um, uh, has dystonia and was stiffer during that time, or maybe there was some other change, um, but they're still labeled as seizure. And so from the point of view of a computer algorithm, it's, that's very difficult to distinguish from the other, some of the other patterns, which you can call more definitively ictal. And because of that lack of distinction in the, in the data set, it's, 
it's not totally clear to me what 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 our algorithms are learning. Mm -hmm. So, Chris, so in the report, actually, they didn't mention the time period when the patient has seizure. Correct. So they'll say like a that most of these are very short clips, um, and so uh, maybe it's ten or twenty minutes long uh, in the temple data set. Um, the uh, and then they'll say during this EEG, there was a, you know, it was abnormal due to the presence of uh, focal slowing in the left temporal area um, and the presence of a um, left temporal seizure. Um, uh, and then they might say how long it lasts. Um, okay. But not uh, really the start and end time, probably. Correct. Because there are clinical reports, as, as Yong was saying, that. It, totally correctly that usually, you know, a very often a clinical report won't include the exact time mm -hmm. and there's not a standard way of including it. Like we, in our own reports, sometimes we'll, we'll, because we all know each other, we'll tend to write it the same way that it occurred from this time or this time to this time. But uh, there's not like one standard way. Uh, it's not encoded into the, into the original EG. So, so the, essentially the, the undergraduates are doing their best, right? They're saying like, I've been told that there's an e there's a seizure here. <laughs> I got to find where it could be. Um, yeah, one thing we can do is to use this learn model. We can um, test on the like adult adult um, seizure data set, which 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 was labeled by the neurologist, and then see if it performs really well on that data set also. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. But unfortunately, we only have child neurology data set, child seizure data set right now. So yeah, we are uh, collaborating with uh, Severance Hospital in Korea. So yeah, we're collecting, still collecting the data set. Well, there might be an opportunity there. We have we have quite a bit of adult data. Oh, that's good. Yeah. So we can we can try it out. Yeah. Um, I think the biggest thing will be, you know, historically it's like false positives are one of the big problems. Um, and it, because in most patients, the amount of time that their seizures occur are less than 1% of the entire EEG. Um, not all, they're occasionally someone with who's very sick, um, but, uh, um, but so it's a very unbalanced um, data set. And of course we're training on optimums that are set for 50 50s. Um, and so I think it makes sense that we get too many false positives. Thank you, Chris and Hengwon and Imon for the very fruitful discussion. Is there any other questions or comments? If not, let's thank our speaker again for this um, great presentation. We will upload the recording of this uh, talk to our YouTube channel later. And yeah, thank you everyone for joining us today. We'll see you next week at the same time. Thank you.